Hello, my name is Jayla Star Johnson. I am the VP of Speaker Relations at the Association of Philosophy Students, and I'm here with Noelle Carroll. And I'm Noelle Carroll. Uh, I teach at uh, the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Uh, my specialty in, in general is, is aesthetics. Uh, I also am very interested in the, the philosophy of the emotions, which is one of the ways that I became uh, in, interested in, in uh, issues like horror because of the intersection of uh, aesthetics, the uh, horror fiction, for example, and, and, and emotion, um, the uh, emotion of horror, uh, which we'll be discussing um, in, in a bit. Um, and uh, I, I wrote a book called, called The Philosophy of Horror. Um, I enjoyed writing that a great deal. Uh, and um, I was able to prove to my parents that all of that time I spent, which they said uh, was was worthless, um, reading comic books and uh, looking at horror movies and reading horror novels, I, I, I proved to them that I was gainfully employed the whole time. Uh, one area uh, of, of horror that I'm also very interested in is its intersection with humor. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen films like, like Scream and you, you know in uh, uh, films like uh, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, there's the uh, always come at the side. So it seems that there's a kind of natural relationship between horror and humor. But on the other hand, that, that's very paradoxical, isn't it? Because uh, one is all about lightness and the other is about heaviness. So uh, these are some of the things that we'll, we'll discuss. And I, I think they have a particular applicability to uh, illuminating certain um, uh, features of, of Halloween. On the philosophy of Halloween, could you just give us a brief rundown of what that is about? One thing that we philosophers think we're in the business of is, is dealing with paradoxes, causing paradoxes, uh, or uh, once one of our colleagues has come up with one, um, uh, dissolving it. Uh, and there is, uh, as I just uh, suggested, uh, a kind of paradox uh, um, uh, with re respect to Halloween. Ha Halloween is uh, uh, descended from um, uh, rituals, uh, some Druidic, uh, originating in uh, Ireland, uh, uh, some then appropriated by by the by the Catholic Church, uh, 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 and these are rituals that are are, are concerned with uh, with the dead. And this is a day uh, when uh, uh, the dead. Uh, dead souls were supposed to uh, ro roam, roam the earth. Uh, and uh, in, in the Druidic versions, um, you put out uh, various food for the, um, for the, for the dead. <laughs> uh, you put out food for them uh, in, only, in order to uh, uh, pay for any wrongs that had been done to them. Uh, uh, and it, it's evolved into a day when, if you think about it, large amount of the imagery is, is of death. Uh, uh, popular costumes or, or skeletons or uh, mo movie monsters of, who, who are dead, Dracula, uh, the mummy, the Frankenstein's monster, uh, maybe Freddy from uh, Elm Street or, or Michael from, from Halloween. Uh, or monsters from out of space that uh, thought of as, as demons from uh, the, the realm of Satan, or, or uh, people dress up as witches or, or, or demons or, or say, Satan himself. These are all horrific characters. Uh, and um, now paradox is um, that, um, for example, uh, think about uh, skeletons and these images of uh, of, of dead and decaying uh, creatures like zombies. We don't find uh, uh, dead people uh, all that entertaining. Uh, we don't go to the morgue uh, to spend an afternoon uh, looking at decaying bodies, although we do spend <laughs> afternoons and, and sometimes evenings uh, in the movie theater or in, in front of our television uh, watching um, uh, 
decaying bodies. Uh, uh, so the paradox is, uh, on, uh, you, could, you could pose it in various ways. One paradox would be, um, why uh, uh, do we seem to take uh, pleasure looking at I images that were we to encounter comparable uh, images, comparable beings in everyday life. So um, the, the paradox of Halloween is um, why, why is it that we take, take pleasure uh, in, in the parade of um, uh, horrific um, and disgusting um, beings uh, that in other circumstances we would never take any pleasure in. Uh, the paradox of horror is why do we take pleasure in in uh, witnessing uh, these fictions or reading these fictions about um, uh, creatures that are uh, uh, fearsome and disgusting, um, uh, which if we were to encounter them in everyday life would head head in the opposite direction. Um, and maybe one way you can see the connection between Halloween, at least in our culture, and 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 horror fictions is uh, the, the way in which uh, the, the, the uh, November becomes kind of the, the, the season of, of horror, uh, right? This is, this, is the, this is when we uh, uh, find um, motion picture companies releasing things like Halloween Kills. Uh, uh, it's a typical uh, a time to uh, stage hor horror uh, 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 festivals on various platforms. So uh, you can think of the, the paradox of Halloween as um, a, 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 a subcategory of, of the paradox of, of horror. The two are very intimately connected. Um, and as I said, the task of a, the philosopher, of one of the tasks of a philosopher is after you've discovered a paradox um, to, to, try and, to try and solve it. And, and my book, uh, uh, The Philosophy of Horror, and, and the writing I've done on uh, Halloween is, is, is exactly concerned with that. I had a couple other questions on the philosophy of horror, but I think you summed them up all pretty well. Uh, so I'm gonna move on to my questions. Uh, about the philosophy of horror. Um, so, and I, I noticed in your bio on the Kuhn website that uh, you have a PhD in cinema studies as well. Yes, I do. From NYU. Yes. So, one of my like graduate school. Yes, yes. Uh, and I, and I, I always like to tell graduate students that, you know, um, graduate, graduate school is a great time of life. Uh, you know, you meet new people, you have interesting discussions, people pay attention to your ideas, uh, you try new food, you have new experiences, it's, you know, sometimes it's good sex. Uh, uh, graduate school is, is, is terrific. I liked it so much that I did it twice. I would have done it a third time, but no one would let me. I mean, that's great to hear. I, um, so I had a question. Graduate students don't appreciate it. They make themselves miserable. Don't be miserable, have fun. Right, that's, that's all what school is about, having fun. Uh, so uh, how did The Exorcist change um, horror film culture? In many ways it did, uh, The Exorcist did, uh, I, I think arguably, um, uh, depend on some very fundamental structures, but of course, one one thing it added um, was not an entirely new source of horror, but a somewhat new source. I mean, demonic possession. Uh, if you go back and you look at the history of uh, um, uh, uh, you know, cinema and also fiction writing, um, demonic possession is not um, is not. Um, is not as recurring, say, as 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 vampires or or werewolves, although it's not completely absent, although well, not in a, a religious form. Uh, there are a, a, a number of fifties, what you could call uh, identity abduction movies. I mean, things like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I mean, th those are those are possession films, right? The pods take over the bodies of. Uh, 
Mom and Dad. And then there's a, a, a film uh, which I highly recommend uh, because, because, uh, called uh, uh, I, I Married a Monster, uh, where, where the wife begins to discern that there's something different about the husband. And there, there are a number of others. So, so the, no, the idea of uh, identity theft is, is not unprecedented. But but certainly giving it giving it the the theological trappings and then you know they, that generated an awful lot of other kind of uh, telekinetic and and possession films, uh, including a black exploitation film, which I think is one of the best black exploitation films called Abby, um, which you can see on YouTube if you're interested. I also saw in the philosophy of horror. I have a question on this. Uh, how was World War I influential to the horror genre? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, one, one way I think that it is, is uh, that James Whale, probably, the, for my money, the best horror director ever. He directed Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, which I think is the best horror film ever made, uh, The Invisible Man and, and, and The First Mummy. Uh, he he fought in World War One, and he fought in World War One. He was in the trenches, and if you think in in, in the Frankenstein films, in in the cemeteries uh, where the crucifixes are and they're digging up the the dead bodies, I, I think that imagery actually it, itself uh, 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 was very influenced by by you know the the vision of the trenches on the Western Front during the during the First World War. So, you know what I think was more important to the emergence of the genre was, was, the sa was sound. Horror is a sound film genre. Uh, you see much more uh, uh, examples of horror in the, the sound area than you do in the silent. And, and there, there are a couple of reasons for that. One, of course, the sound effects. Uh, you know, the, the crashing lightning, Dr. Frankenstein's electrodes, uh, chains uh, being dragged through the castle, howls in the middle of the night. Uh, uh, all those things uh, uh, are, are, are more easily available in sound. Plus, there's some something else. Um, in horror films, there are very often great speeches, right? Uh, Dr. Frankenstein gives speeches about the justification of his creation. Dracula gives uh, or, oratorical um, uh, uh, flights about uh, uh, being immortal and living forever. And then, you know, mad scientists explain all of the time uh, their, their experiments and uh, the experiments have to be destroyed by the pro uh, by the protagonist. You know, we're going to get a, a radium reflector and we're going to do blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of talking. In, in, in horror films. And, and uh, I don't think it would be readily, uh, I don't think it could have been and, and wasn't um, uh, readily sustained by endless intertitles in silent films. Uh, so I think the in innovation of sound was extremely important to the success of the, of, of, of the horror film. I will imagine the invisible man if you had to do it with intertitles instead of Claude Rain's voice. It would have been, you know, people would just go, what? <laughs> um, so, uh, and by the way, it's not the only genre. Uh, detect detective fiction is like that too. Court trials. Uh, again, the problem would be that they have so much talking that they wouldn't sustain endless intertitles. And I think that's a great lead into my next question. Uh, what is the catharsis of pity and fear? Well, um, that Aristotle, of course, thinks of uh, uh, the function of tragedy as uh, arousing pity and fear um, uh, for the purpose of uh, eliciting this thing called catharsis, which is kind of mysterious, right? because um, it's only mentioned once or twice in the poetics. It is mentioned in the politics, but in the politics, he also says something like, but you know, I'm not gonna talk about it too much because I've dealt with it ex elsewhere, which is presumably the poetics. Um, but of course, you know, we don't have all of the poetics. We only have a small part of it. So maybe he explained it there, but we don't know. So. 
there are various theories of what this catharsis is. Um, one, uh, one, one is uh, that uh, the catharsis is um, a, a kind of form of pur purgation. You cause pity and fear in order to get uh, to, to drive it out. Uh, it, it, it's like homeopathic medicine. Right. Uh, uh, if somebody has a fever, what do you do? You pile covers on, on them uh, uh, to, to get them to sweat, to, to, to drive, drive it out. Uh, so that, that, that's one view. And of course, that's the, the view that's often defended by uh, uh, mass media producers when they say, well, violence in the mass media, actually that, you know, it, People work out their violent tendencies. They get rid of it by uh, being uh, by playing a, a, a guess, aggressive shooter games. Um, so that that's one one theory. Um, I, I don't think that that is Ar Aristotle's theory. Um, one thing is that that Aristotle says that tragedies uh, are, are are appropriate uh, for the best kind of people, for decent people. Uh, and uh, you, you wouldn't think that decent or uh, the best people uh, actually need this, this uh, purgation. Um, so I favor another kind of interpretation. Uh, it's not a therapy. Uh, uh, it's more a matter of education. Um, uh, what it does is it, it clarifies uh, our, our emotions uh, so that uh, you're it teaches or for the best people, it enables them to reflect on what the appropriate objects of the emotions of pity and fear turn out to be. And, and the particular one they're interested in is um, what we would call tragic emotion. Uh, and think of Oedipus Rex. The, the Oedipus Rex ends uh, with a, 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 an ancient Greek saying, um, the gender is a little sexist, but the ending is call no man happy until he is dead. And, and that is the appropriate uh, uh, object of the tragic emotion. And what it means is uh, we're all subject to the vicissitudes of fate what Martha Nussbaum calls the fragility of goodness, or what we could call, uh, or we have the saying, bad things happen to good people. Uh, so people in the Greek tragedies, uh, I, I, they're not doing things that are morally wrong, uh, but, but they're stricken with faith. I mean, Oedipus is actually trying to do the right thing. He leaves Corinth because he knows that he's uh, that it's been predicted that he'll he'll kill his father and sleep with his mother. So he leaves Corinth to go to Thebes, but of course, in doing that, uh, unbeknownst to him, trying to do the right thing, uh, he kills his father on the way, and then he uh, uh, sleep, sleeps with his mother. So you you never can tell when the, when faith will fate will destroy you when you're alive. It's not until you're dead that you know that you've escaped the worst that fate can do to you. Uh, that's why no one can be happy until they're dead. It, that thing, that, uh, uh, that, that uh, omnipresence of fate in, in, in our lives is, is the, the proper object of, of uh, tragic emotion. Um, when we look at a tragedy, we should fear, because if that can happen to Oedipus, it could happen to me. And we should pity, uh, because through no fault of his own, he's destroyed himself. Uh, so that it leads to the catharsis of, of pity and fear. It shows us what pity and what the appropriate objects of pity and fear are. Um, so that you see, again, that I, I have this uh, uh, abiding interest in the relationship of the, the emotions to aesthetic questions. Uh, what is, what is uh, uh, really the, the function of tragedy? What is this thing, catharsis, that it's supposed to uh, uh, enable audiences to reflect upon and understand better? Why is the horror genre designed in a certain way that evokes um, specific emotions 
the view I have of, of the horror genre is uh, very influenced by <coughs> Aristotle's approach. He, he thinks that tragedy is supposed to evoke uh, a combination of pity and fear. Uh, I, I think that what we, we classify as the horror, uh, as a horror film or a horror fiction, a book by Stephen King or, or Clive Barker or Mary Shelley uh, 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 or uh, uh, horror, horror films also engenders a compound emotional state. Uh, it's not pity and fear, it's fear and disgust. Um, you know, uh, uh, th think of, of, of at least paradigmatic examples of, of, of the horror genre, you know, The Walking Dead. Um, you, you're not only afraid of them because if they bite you, you'll turn into The Walking Dead. Even if that wasn't so, you wouldn't want to touch them. You wouldn't want to kiss a zombie, right? <clears throat> They're impure creatures. Uh, even Dracula, uh, sometimes he's he's uh, very handsome, but but when you see those teeth, uh, uh, you 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 know you're not only afraid of them, but you know uh, it probably hasn't you know brushed them for a, a century. <laughs> Uh, so, and, and you know, you, you think of the various uh, ways in which horror creatures are designed. It, it's not only that you're frightened uh, of them because of the physical, or, or if, if it's something like Satan and the Exorcist, the mental uh, uh, harm that they could do to you. Uh, there's also something re repulsive. Well, if you read a novel, uh, if you read a horror novel, um, sometimes just for an exercise, take a pencil, uh, hold a pencil uh, while you're reading, and whenever the horror creature is being introduced, you'll notice certain things. Uh, suddenly, the narrator will uh, say there's been a change in the temperature, and also uh, a, a terrible stink has started to arise, uh, and and words like. Uh, abomination, repelled, uh, or all kinds of uh, uh, words uh, that uh, uh, signal disgust begin to be begin to be marshaled. Uh, I think it'll be stunned by the regularity in in, in which those kind of formulas uh, um, uh, reappear. You know, they they're already there in in, in Mary Shelley. Uh, um, that's that's why Frankenstein, the doctor, the, uh, 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 abandons his his creature because once the creature becomes alive, it disgusts him and he he, he sees its its yellow pallor and he runs from the room. Uh, so uh, I think the disgust is uh, is key to to what we uh, think of as as horror. Um, and you know, I, 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 at least uh, you know. I, if you're a horror fan or whoever is listening to me is a horror fan, of, of course, we're going to start quibbling about examples. Uh, but uh, if you just think of the prototypical cases, uh, you know, alien from outer space, the predator, uh, 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 again and again, uh, the, the creatures are disgusting. I mean, the, the Frankenstein monster, he's, he's an assemblage of dead bodies. Not not a not a very not a very pleasant thing to, to contemplate. Uh, so uh, I I I think I think that uh, you know uh, you see that this formula engendering uh, fear and disgust, <clears throat> at, at least for the purposes of our discussion, um, covers a lot of territory. Uh, it, it's very it's very it's very very general. Um, I suppose that. Uh, my my first claim in behalf of this formula is, uh, uh, as as the Wittgensteinians used to say, "Look and see." Uh, and like, why do we subject ourselves to this fiction that will horrify us? Oh, uh, I I think I think that the the reason um, is that uh, horror fictions come with the promise of fascination. They promise to show us uh, something uh, that, that we've, we've never, never seen. Uh, 
they they promised that. Now I I'm emphasizing promise because uh, they very often fail to succeed in showing us something uh, that that's fascinating. Um, you know, there are an awful lot of uh, routine horror fictions, um, but um, great horror fictions uh, actually. Uh, uh, they abide by that contract. They, they abide by that that promise of fascinating us, of of holding our attention, of of you know, presenting something to us that that's an unbelievable, uh, and 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 that we we can't take our eyes off of or we can't stop uh, reading about because of of its uh, its its fascination. Um, now, uh, I, I'm not saying that that's the only uh, 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 reason that that people may be in, interested in in horror films. Uh, uh, I, I I think um, that uh, especially for people at, at the age um, when they're most likely to to be interested in horror films. Uh, you know, when you go to a, a movie theater to see a horror film, there, there's usually a group of teenagers, um, and then there's some old man like me sitting sitting in the back uh, who maybe has never grown up. Uh, but what? Why are the teenagers there? Well, I I, I think that um, for them, uh, in a way, uh, horror spectacles do have a certain kind of therapeutic value. Um, I, I think that uh, we all can uh, introspect and, and, and uh, say that at least at some time in our life, we, we were afraid of our emotions. We, we had a fear of fear. Um, we had a fear that, um, you know, uh, we, we might become uncontrollable uh, uh, and uh, 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 especially as 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 adolescents you know and, and our bodies began to change uh, uh, and um, uh, well our bodies began to change and with them our emotions began to change and we began to acquire some new emotions uh, we came, became a little uh, wary uh, um, the uh, uh, American president, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, gave a speech where he said, the only thing we have to fear is, is fear itself. Uh, I, I think that uh, there's, there's a time of life, especially when we're um, afraid of uh, our, our emotions in, in general and, and fear in particular. And that, that um, the ritual of a, a group of teenagers going to see uh, a, a horror film is, is a practice with dealing with fear. Uh, you know, if you deal, if you go with a group or you remember going with a group to see uh, horror films, there are also those, those, those people, uh, uh, you know, let's call them guys, there are always those guys in the group who, who try to scare everyone in the group. <laughs> by uh, making a loud unexpected noise or, or, or whatever. Uh, it, it was always a kind of testing uh, to, to see, uh, maybe particularly for men. I mean that, you know, I'm not afraid. I can, you know, I can look at anything. Uh, uh, I, can, I, I can take it. So I, I think that at certain times of, of, of life, um, one of the motives for seeing uh, horror films not, not, might not only be uh, the, the, this promise of seeing something fascinating, something that you would find incredibly gripping, uh, that you would just kind of look at uh, in, in awe, uh, um, not, not uh, in, in a religious sense of awe, but in, in a, a, the sense of, wow, that's just incredible. Um, uh, you know, as humans, we're a peculiar species because we're, we're not satisfied with existence. We want something supernatural. Uh, and uh, so that certainly is one of the calling cards of, of horror. But another calling card, I think, as I said, uh, at least in certain times of life, uh, is, is to go and have test runs on fear. Uh, a, a way of uh, um, uh, reassuring ourselves that 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 we can we can handle. 
And speaking of the promise of suspense or the promise of like a scare with a horror film, uh, I guess this is a two part or three part question. Uh, so what is horror? And then what is art horror? And um, I guess, and also speaking of great films, what is the difference between a horror story and a horror story that deals with monsters and myths? Okay, well, um, uh, horror is, some, is something that I haven't actually been talking about. Horror is, is you know, uh, real horror is, uh, you know, something like Auschwitz. Uh, and um, I was talking about something uh, which I was, which I call art horror, which is horror um, uh, in, 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 in fiction, um, in, in movies, in, in, in painting, uh, in, in comic books, in graphic novels, that I was talking about that, that sort of horror, which is um, um, created for the purposes of uh, entertainment and appreciation, and, and in some cases, edification. Now, um, you were making a distinction between, uh, I think the distinction that you want me to talk about is uh, why, uh, this hasn't come up so far, but why I think uh, that works of horror require uh, monsters, monsters that are fearsome and, and disgusting. Um, and uh, lots of people say, well, that's what you don't need a monster now now sometimes they they think that because they haven't thought clearly about it they'll say well what about michael myers in halloween he's not a monster well if if anything keeps coming back <laughs> after they've been shot burnt crushed um, 22 times uh i i, I would say that's a, a supernatural being that's a that's a that's a monster um, uh, the same with J uh, you know uh, Jason, Friday the Thirteenth, Freddy from Nightmare on Elm Street, um, Chucky. Uh, well, Chucky is not even, not even an animate being. Uh, so a lot of the candidates uh, uh, for uh, the the stars of of, of horror are, are monsters, um, literally. Um, but then, what about the ones that? people are disposed to call horror, but are not supernatural monsters. Um, and, and the one that always comes up is, is Norman Bates from Psycho. Uh, because people want to classify Psycho as a horror film. Uh, but uh, on my account, uh, that uh, horror films have to have monsters who are supernatural, uh, by which I mean, don't exist according to the canons of, 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 of contemporary science. Uh, uh, it doesn't look like Norman Bates is a, is, is a, uh, a monster, but, but people are convinced Psycho has to be a horror film. Now, I'll, I'll say one reason why I didn't uh, count Psycho as a horror, a horror film. Uh, I, I didn't count, count Psycho as a horror film, but uh, I didn't go on to explain why I think people uh, would count it as a horror film. Um, I think the reason that people count it as a horror film and especially count it as a horror film when it came out was because in the context of America in 1960, uh, cross-dressing was a mark of homosexuality which was considered to be unnatural. And I didn't say that because I didn't want to be accused of being homophobic. I didn't want people to say, oh, Carol says that being gay is unnatural. But I think that um, the audiences, the original audiences for, the, for Psycho, uh, because he was a transvestite at the very least, and they associated that with being gay, uh, was that the audience did did actually uh, regard him as somehow creepy uh, and not only dangerous because he w welded a knife, but, but disgusting. I think uh, with some other examples uh, that people bring up, 
there are other there are pretty straightforward uh, uh, explanations. For example, um, silence of silence of the, the lambs. Um, people would say, well, he he's not a he's not a monster. Um, uh, the Anthony Hopkins character is not a monster. He 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 he's you know anything but a monster. He is a monster in in, in the sense that. You'll, you'll never find any character like that uh, in, in the psychiatric manual of mental, mental abnormalities. Uh, I mean, he, he, can, he tells what's going on in Starling's, uh, Starling's mind, you know, from a distance. Uh, he knows what Buffalo Bill is doing from a distance. Um, he's omniscient. Uh, if, if he's... Like anything, he's he's a satanic or Mephistophelian figure. He's he 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 knows everything um, just by thinking, apparently. Uh, so he's not really um, uh, a psychotic uh, by any actual uh, uh, scientific uh, understanding of psychotics nowadays. I mean, he's not even on the Asperger scale, you know. He's as much a psychotic as, as the shark in Jaws is the kind of shark that a marine biologist would recognize. Uh, you know, in, in, the, in the second uh, version of Jaws, uh, the, the, shark, the shark apparently had a companion and the companion like travels about 3000 miles to get revenge on the, on the people that uh, blew up his uh, or her, her, her mate in the first film. Uh, so, you know, very often uh, these things that uh, science does acknowledge uh, that we don't consider monsters, uh, psychotics on the one hand, uh, and all, all kinds of uh, uh, creatures like uh, uh, Cujo, uh, the, the Stephen King dog. Uh, well, Cujo is self-conscious. Uh, we don't think of, of big dogs like that as being self-conscious. And uh, so uh, what I wanna say, uh, I, I've gone into this backwards by describing uh, the cases. What, what to me uh, is an answer that I wanna give to a lot of people who say, uh, oh no, you don't need uh, something that defies uh, scientific existence uh, to have a horror film because you've got psychotic slashes on the one hand and you've got um, uh, you know, sharks and bears and alligators. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, those things all exist. They do, but they don't meet any credible scientific description. So they're monsters. Um, um, and I'll just say one more word, word about this. Uh, people then finally say to me, um, because I spend so much time and energy kind of uh, explaining this, they say, well, why do you care? <laughs> what difference does it make? Um, well, it makes one important difference, right? Um, if it's just a matter of uh, uh, creatures uh, or, or that instill um, fear and maybe disgust, um, then it seems like there's, there, there, there are innumerable thrillers, uh, uh, crime films, uh, you know, films of, uh, of abduction and torture uh, that, that would count as horror films that everyone would agree is, are not horror films. So, you know, Clint Eastwood film about um, the, that San Francisco uh, um, uh, serial killer. Uh, I, I forget the serial killer's name. Uh, well, that's not a horror film. Uh, and everyone would admit that, or a, a film of the Boston Strangler. That's not a horror film. Uh, I think everyone would agree that, that that shouldn't be in the, well, we don't have video stores anymore, but that shouldn't be in the video section of the store if we, if, if, if we still had them. Um, so that's the reason. That's the reason why I... Uh, uh, hang on tooth and claw uh, uh, to uh, the idea that, that, that uh, uh, it's useful. Uh, it's useful at least for uh, 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 getting intellectual grip on the core of what's horror. Uh, uh, 
there may be some things that are on the border and, and uh, on the periphery. And those things like psycho are things that I, I would try and explain why people are drawn to calling them horror. Uh, even, even if I uh, uh, quibble about where the border is exactly. On the note of like why people are drawn to call things horror, uh, what is the cognitive evaluative theory? Well, um, I, I, when I wrote that book, I did hold a cognitive evaluative theory. Um, uh, although I now uh, would verify uh, it. The cognitive evaluative theory is that um, um, what identifies an, an, an emotion is, is its cognitive component. Um, which many people uh, identified uh, with uh, uh, with beliefs. I, I don't actually uh, think that that even even in, in the old days I didn't think the cognitive component was a belief. I thought it was a different uh, uh, psychological state. I thought it was an imagining. Uh, but uh, the cognitive imagine uh, co cognitive emo evaluative theories. Uh, uh, maintain that, um, uh, uh, philosophically speaking, that the emotions are identified by their uh, cognitive components. Um, uh, in, in, in my case, it, it was an imagining. And, and also, uh, uh, that cognitive component is an evaluative. Uh, 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 fear and disgust are, are negative evaluations of things. Uh, now, uh, since then, of course, the cognitive uh, evaluative theory of emotions has been challenged by various neo-Jamesian views, which think that what actually uh, 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 activates the emotional state is, is not a cognition, but a kind of um, per, per, uh, perception that's uh, 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 non-categorical. Uh, so uh, the, the neo-Jamesian would say, uh, the first stage of an emotional uh, process is um, uh, some kind of very, very uh, um, uh, general uh, 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 perceptual state. So you're walking down um, uh, the park and, and you, you see something that has this kind of shape uh, uh, and, and uh, your first, the first stage of your uh, emotional process is watch out. Maybe because it's a shape that's reminiscent of a snake, right? Uh, but but then later um, downstream, uh, you cognitively evaluate it and say, oh, that's not a snake. That's that's a stick. That's a bent stick. Uh, so that's where the, the cognitive uh, evaluation is. So uh, the cognitive evaluating theory that I was working with um, front-ended, so to speak, the cognitive state. Uh, and um, uh, whereas the Neo-Jamesian view back-ends it. Now, I, I think that there are, uh, frankly, I think there are emotional states uh, uh, that are front-ended and some that are back-ended in terms of the, the, uh, cog uh, the cognitive versus the neo-Jamesian uh, view. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm more, more pluralistic. I haven't completely given up the uh, cognitive evaluative theory. I just think that um, uh, there, there are other kinds of states and that we as philosophers should be uh, um, Co committed to actually, you know, uh, uh, um, isolating these various states. But, and this is the important point that I would like to make, whether you're an, a Neo-Jamesian and you've got it front-ended or you're a, a back-ended or a cognitivist and you've got it front-ended, what the state is, is, is an appraisative state. The emotional state is still, in either case, evaluative. Right, and so uh, I think I can recuperate uh, almost everything I have to say uh, by being pluralistic, um, saying, "Well, sometimes Jamesian, sometimes cognitivist, 
uh, but saying what, what's really important, especially from an analytic point of view, um, less uh, philosophical, but if you're trying to analyze particular works of, uh, uh, of horror, what, what's really important is that it's an appraisal. Um, it, it's an appraisal and that what the, the fiction writer or the uh, movie producer uh, does is uh, foreground, um, uh, uh, foreground those features of the situation um, that are, are, are required to elicit that initiating, um, uh, that initiating uh, appraisal, appraising state. So, for example, if you're making The Walking Dead, what you want to do is make sure that you have, you know, the superations of the zombies' flesh and their eye falling out uh, foregrounded in your shot uh, so that you'll get a disgust appraisal. Uh, um, and, you know, it, it's less important in, in terms of, uh, for you as a director as, as to whether or not uh, that that the, that appraisal is is being uh, made cognitively or perceptually. Oh, thank you very much, Carol. I believe that is all of my questions. But I I do have one more question actually, um, because I did read in the acknowledgments of horror and humor that your parents did think that horror books were a waste of money. Um, and sorry if I'm pinning you against them right now, but uh, what is your opinion on that? Well, you know, I was talking about reading these horror books when I was an adolescent. Um, and I think that anything that gets you to read as an adolescent is good because uh, so much of your future, especially uh, nowadays, is going to depend on your being. Uh, a reader and and the way to get you to be a reader <laughs> is to get you to read uh you know if if you don't get to be a reader and you don't like reading you're not going to like school and if you don't like school in the kind of industrial societies that that we live in or post industrial societies of the united states and canada that we we live in, um, you know. If you if you don't if if you don't like school and you drop out early and everything, in most cases that's going to be a terrible social setback. So I'm all for people reading graphic novels and horror novels, and what whatever, uh, whatever they uh, whatever you can get people to read, whatever you can get young people to read, however you can excite them in reading. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's all to the good for them and for the society as a whole. And, oh, sorry, one more quick question. Uh, when did you, you know you wanted to, to write on these topics? Well, <laughs> you know, uh, I backed into this because I wanted to write a book for Rutledge, uh, on uh, they had a they had a series um, uh, on on British authors and I wanted to write a, a, a little monograph on one of the British authors and so I said uh, uh, to to an editor at Rutledge I'd like to do that that book and and he said well you know uh, you're American and and that series they just want written they want British people to write on British authors. Um, so uh, you, you don't have a chance on that. But he had seen that I had given a lecture uh, 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 on, a, on a series on, on film with, with Stanley Cavell at Queens College. And, and he said, you know, but I would take a book from you on the philosophy of art. I would never have thought of that. I didn't have tenure at that point. And you know the possibility of writing a book called *The Philosophy of Horror* and sending it to you know Oxford University Press or Cornell University Press, uh, you know what the readers' report would be. There's no such thing as the philosophy of horror, <laughs> and that would be the end. But since I was given a contract, I, I wrote it. 